Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Emma, and my topic for today is assessing the connectivity of natural systems in the Greater Golden Horseshoe through an application of the effective mesh size. So the Golden Horseshoe is a metropolitan region in southern Ontario, located in the heart of the Great Lakes. It houses valuable agricultural land and sensitive ecological features like the Oak Ridges Moraine and the Niagara Escarpment. Um, the Golden Horseshoe also encompasses most of the Greenbelt area, which covers over 2 million acres of permanently protected land under the Greenbelt Act. So because of the rapid population growth in this region, natural areas in the Golden Horseshoe were historically cleared for agriculture, settlements, and development. This resulted in habitat loss and degradation with a subsequent decline of biodiversity. The natural landscape became highly fragmented, isolating habitat patches and whole populations of species. So loss of connectivity across patches has profound impacts on ecosystems. With limited connections, species cannot migrate nor adapt to changes in their environment, which is increasingly important in this age of climate change. So the several provincial plans exist to protect these natural and agricultural features. But for this project, I considered the ones central to the Greenbelt, which are the Oak Ridges Marine Conservation Plan, the Greenbelt Plan, and the Niagara Scarpin Plan. Um, across the protective policies in place for natural systems, there is a lack of monitoring effectiveness. For example, um, the Greenbelt Plan um, has two performance indicators for its natural systems, percent woodland cover and percent wetland cover. These indicators are area based. They tell us about the quantity, but not how the quality of natural systems is being affected by urbanization and development. We cannot infer details such as the impacts on connectivity, the state of biodiversity or ecological integrity. So over the summer, I had the opportunity to work with the Greenbelt Foundation on their ongoing sustainability indicators project. My role was to test and develop um, a list of recommended indicators of natural specific project, however, I focused on one level of assessment, landscape connectivity and fragmentation through a procedure called the effective mesh size. So my project objectives were to test whether the effective mesh size MF is a suitable indicator of landscape connectivity in the Golden Horseshoe, to test the application of the effective mesh size and um, its derivative effective mesh density SF to available spatial data and mapping. And finally, to compare and quantify the fragmentation of connect and connectivity of natural cover across various scales in the Golden Horseshoe. Um, so the effective mesh size is a measure developed by Dr. Jaeger from Concordia University. It has been adopted in several European countries as an indicator of landscape fragmentation. MF basically represents the probability of two random points on a landscape being connected um, without any obstruction. So the greater the number of barriers, the lower the probability of connection and thus the lower the MF value. Um, from MF, we can derive the effective mesh density SF, which tells us the number of meshes per unit area. So these two metrics essentially overlay a mesh of differing densities over the landscape. MF and SF are inversely related. So a well-connected landscape would have a high MF, but a low SF, a larger mesh size and fewer meshes. So the study area I considered was the Golden Horseshoe and the Greenbelt, which, are, which were further broken up into the following planning units. In the first row is the Golden Horseshoe with the Greenbelt area removed. This was done to compare fragmentation inside versus outside the Greenbelt. Um, then we have upper and lower tier municipalities. Um, for ecological units, I considered secondary and tertiary watersheds. Finally, we have the green belt itself, as well as its various policy designations. So the purpose of breaking the regions into planning units was to look at landscape fragmentation across different scales. 
I used versions two and three of Solaris, which is, which is a region, regional land cover data set derived from Landsat imagery covering Southern Ontario. Version two goes up to 2011, while version three goes up to around 2016. Solaris maps different land cover classes, which I then reclassified as non-natural or natural cover. Then I compared MF and SF between 2011 and 2016 to understand the change over the five-year period. So overall, the trend in MF and SF were negative, both inside and outside the green belt. The change was much greater outside the green belt. So this could be a result of the protective policies of the Green Belt Plan, which displaces urbanization and development to intensify outside the Green Belt area. But it's important to note that connectivity declined in the Green Belt as well, indicating that these policies may not be rigid or restrictive enough to completely deter urban encroachment into the protected natural areas of the Green Belt. So of the four designations in the Green Belt, the Oak Ridges Moraine was the least fragmented. But if we look at how these designations have changed over the five years, the greatest loss of connectivity, the area in red, occurred in the most well-connected region of the Green Belt, the Oak Ridges Moraine. Um, this change highlights the intrusion of development into a protected feature despite its recognized ecological significance. So there are a couple of factors that might explain this decline. The ORMCP, the Conservation Plan, um, currently restricts urban development that would negatively impact natural features, but there is a history of pre-approved developments that predates the plan. Uh, which we call legacy or transitional development. Um, additionally, uh, aggregate extraction is not currently prohibited in the ORMCP's designated natural linkage areas, though it is prohibited in the natural core areas. Um, so fragmentation, as we know, occurs when natural corridors and linkages are not preserved. In the Oak Ridges Marine. So next, I'm going to zoom out and talk about the other planning units in the entire study area. Um, these maps represent the range of values for MF across um, upper and single tier municipalities in the Golden Horseshoe, left being 2011 and the right being 2016. So the southern part of the Golden Horseshoe near Toronto is more fragmented than areas um, in the northern side. And notably, York's MF declined between 2011 and 2016, possibly due to its proximity to fast growing areas like the Peel region and Toronto. Peterborough is the least fragmented upper municipality in the Golden Horseshoe, while Toronto is the most fragmented single tier municipality. Most of the other regions also show an increase in mesh density, indicating fragmentation. So it's valuable to ask, for regions with low and intermediate MF values, like the red and the orange, have we retained some areas that are still relatively unfragmented? So we can break this down to a finer scale and look to lower tier municipalities. So there are some regions uh, with better, marginally better connectivity in previously completely red municipalities, denoted by the white boxes. But the only area above an MF of 25 kilometers squared is Trent Lakes in Peterborough. But even that has declined to about half its size by 2016. Trent Lakes industry was mainly recreational, um, cottaging, fishing, camping, but has recently grown in population because of its easy commute um, to the GTA area. Here I highlight changes from the previous slides, two maps. So everything from yellow to red indicates a loss of connectivity. However, we also see some positive changes in green, indicating a gain in MF of up to 0.25 kilometers squared. But it's best to be critical and suspicious when interpreting smaller changes when, when we're looking at a huge data set uh, that is also coarse, like Solrus, as differences in mapping might manifest as marginal gains or losses. 
So it is difficult to conclude without field collected data or high resolution imagery, whether these smaller changes are true changes. Uh, moving into the ecological units. So these secondary watersheds in the Golden Horseshoe seem to tell a different story with the Niagara River and the Northern Lake Ontario watershed showing the highest connectivity despite overlapping with much of the GTA. But if we take a closer look and consider tertiary watersheds, the Northern Lake Ontario and Niagara River, Niagara River watershed is composed of mostly fragmented sub watersheds. Only one tertiary watershed has an MF above 25 kilometers squared in 2011 and a non um, in 2016, showing a steady decline in connectivity across watershed boundaries. 10 minutes. So, mark. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this confirms and aligns with the results from our other planning units that the effects of urbanization are spilling over into some of the Golden Horseshoe's most intact and functional remaining ecosystems. Um, it's also critical, it's also important to be critical of results on a larger scale because one area of good connectivity might compensate for multiple, multiple extensively fragmented areas, as we see here. So my main takeaways, overall, these results confirm the impacts of urban sprawl as connectivity is decreasing outward from the central metropolitan area to the rest of the Golden Horseshoe. They also confirm that policy plans and the establishment of the Greenbelt may be slowing, but are not stopping urbanization and habitat degradation. This is a concern because Ontario's population is expected to grow substantially, which will increase pressures on um, biodiversity. So some limitations of my study. This methodology is best applied when planning units are of a similar size, and it may not represent the optimal habitat corridors for all species, though the MF can be derived for specific species and, or taxonomic group, groups based on habitat suitability. Additionally, SOLRIS is a good data set, but because of its extent, um, it misses a lot of fine details. So the true changes in fragmentation might be limited by incorrect classification. Uh, the SOLRIS pixel resolution might be insufficient in reliably measuring fragmentation on finer scales. So some results were possibly over or underestimated. So my oh, recommendation, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so my recommendations, um, the effective mesh size can be implemented as an indicator of fragmentation in Ontario, but to monitor change over time, there need to be set thresholds that are applicable to different scales. From there, the province can establish goals to minimize changes in MF and thereby prevent further habitat loss and highlight priority areas of conservation. However, effective monitoring also requires more frequent and high resolution mapping. And all the above mentioned points can only be achieved by more coordination across um, government bodies and policy plans. Um, okay, before the questions, I would like to acknowledge and thank my internal supervisor, Daniela, for her guidance and her patience. Jackie, who made adjusting to work in a pandemic very easy and was a pleasure to work with. My tax for funding my internship and project. The rest of the folks at the Greenbelt Foundation who are always helpful and supportive. And lastly, I would like to thank my graduate peers, my family and the faculty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amal. That was great, very interesting. I'd like to start the discussion with, uh, with Jackie. Thanks, Amal. That was an amazing presentation. Um, and I want to start just by thanking Amal for the great work she's done over this past year. It's been a, a difficult year for all of us to, to work, and so we really appreciate everything she's done. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, so the first one relates to the types of development that you think might be picked up by this type of indicator. So um, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on whether this is a more appropriate indicator for 
looking at like large scale losses or for things like roads or linear infrastructure that might be going through our natural areas? Yeah, I think um, this would be a better indicator for, um, well, if we're looking at a large scale, then possibly linear structures like roads would be um, more easily picked up by, by this calculation. But if we are looking at fine scale, then um, most infrastructure and development that um, removes natural areas would be picked up, I think. Okay, great. <laughs> um, and then, I was just thinking, like, in looking at your maps, I don't know if you can go back to them, but yeah, yeah. some of the areas over in um, Niagara area, like down near Hamilton, uh, not Niagara, Hamilton, in the kind of corner of Lake Ontario, those are some of the, like, they're um, really important ecologically within the Niagara Escarpment. Um, and they're, my understanding is they're pretty well connected, um, but I, I guess it's a, an issue of scale that we it are is, yeah. to pick those up. So um, yeah, I guess just your thoughts on, on how we can integrate those smaller scale features and the importance of keeping those connected. Um, so for the smaller scale, like that is the main problem with this analysis that Solaris was a like high scale um, data set. So what I found was maybe a lot of the well-connected patches, uh, like from the Niagara Escarpment, for example, were not reflected. I would, my, like, I, like I mentioned at the end, we probably need high resolution mapping that is standard across municipalities. Like that's the only way that you could possibly capture these fine details and have them incorporated into like the calculation of an MF. That's great. Thank you. Great work. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> any um, any other question? I'll just ask that if you're if you're not uh, involved in the conversation, if you'd mute your microphone, please, so that we don't get distracted by uh, background noise. Um, does anyone else have a, a comment or question? Um, I have a question for Amal. Yes. Go ahead. Um, hey, Amal, uh, it's, um, in a way, I'm not surprised with the Oak Ridges Marine. We knew that in 2004, that, that <laughs> this is going to happen, uh, that the legacy development, um, it, it will have an effect. So, and it's not so like about your methodology, it's more question like, you know, once when we have proof like that, this, is it fair to speak? say that we have a plan. I mean, you know, they allowed um, legacy development to go ahead. And in fact, because of that, the Oak Ridges Marine plan, it's, uh, it wasn't effective immediately. Hmm. So sending the message to the province about this, I don't know if they're, they're going to listen. I, I think, um, it's one way probably through uh, the Greenbelt Foundation, but it, it also, despite like all the limits that we know about the scale, about the data showing that the two indicators that they use, the area, it's, it's just, just not enough. And in particularly with the, the mapping uh, 15 meters, it's not enough for urban areas. Um, so anyhow, it's, um, you know, I'm just wondering what would be the best way to send the message to the province about this? Um, I think for the legacy transitional development, sending a message, like it's a very complicated business when it comes to the pre-approved development. I don't think they can do much up to stop it at this point. Um, I read like, I read a thesis that some members of the uh, municipal government were hopeful that these effects would diminish over time. But um, but that's like the only thing that I see. I don't think we can stop that development, but in other cases, um, how best to send a message? I think it's um, through reports from organizations like the Greenbelt Foundation, Ontario Nature, and especially through um, the community. I, I feel like that if the community speaks up, that um, the government would be more inclined to 
add more indicators. I think these plans always go through a review every couple of years. So it's not impossible to incorporate new items and new measures. So that's that would be my answer. Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. I've got a follow-up question <laughs> that Daniela okay. kind of triggered, if that's okay. Um, you'll, you'll be next. Thanks, Jackie. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Jackie. Oh, Sally sorry, will follow up. After some notes. Okay. Um, yeah, so speaking of these, um, you know, not picking up those smaller scale things, I know we've, we've talked about also the kind of areas of potential. So they might not be, we might not classify them as natural cover, yeah. um, but it, do you think there's a way we can communicate this like loss of future restoration? You know, if you if you pave over uh, whatever it is right now, it's just a, a fallow field. Uh, it'll never get to be a forest. Um, so I don't know how we if um, if you'd see that in the kind of fragmentation type of indicator, or if we should have a separate indicator that shows the kind of potential new natural cover on the landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't think the fragmentation indicator would be the best for that, especially since currently this like the mapping doesn't pick up on a lot of these areas. Um, yeah, I think we would have a, we would need to have a separate indicators that this indicator that like after documenting these areas, um, you could send a message, hey, like there are so many areas here that if you leave, like if you do not develop over them in a couple of years, they could help um, uh, they could help like the ecosystem like bounce back in this area. So yeah, that would be my answer. Thank you. Thank you. I am Mollet Sally. Um, Hi. Nice, very nice for uh, the um, the culture in this area and. Um, I don't, you know, a lot of your assumptions were that um, the encroachment is from development. Do you have any sort of proof as to maybe how much is turning to agriculture from possibly woodlots? Because there is a demand for local food production mm -hmm. and those types of things in the area. And I'm wondering yeah. if you have any idea or how you would include that um, in your analysis. Um, for that, I think what I did when I reclassified the natural cover was it was a simple natural non natural. So it was very, um, it was So if I was to incorporate agriculture, then I would probably um, reclassify into more categories and try to run the analysis that way, then you could see how much specifically turned into agriculture, how much turned into like aggregate extraction or something else. As part of Amal's work that she did over the summer though, she was looking at kind of case studies, Sally. So she zoomed in and looked at, I think Brampton was one of them mm -hmm. where she used like Google Earth. And I, I mean, especially in Brampton, of course we did see <clears throat> that it was development that was going in. Um, but aggregate was another thing I think we saw quite a bit of aggregate extraction. Hmm. Okay, thank you. I may follow up with you later, Amal. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> that would be perfect. That's great. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Sally. It is time for us to move on to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, thank you, Amal, for an interesting presentation.